So so it's Mr. Hunter. I'm just um, going to do a little bit of a um, podcast on The Crucible, uh, the last few pages of Act 1 and uh, hopefully most of Act 2, just exploring the character development and the conflicts that ensure in terms of this text. I suppose uh, my class finished with uh, Abigail speaking to Hale in Paris and trying to explain the situation in the woods and she was getting cornered to an extent and Betty still hadn't woken yet. So the, the, these people were all searching for answers. I suppose the Putmans were searching for answers. And I suppose a key thing that in terms of this conflict that Abigail is trying to deflect blame from herself and so as she is one of the least powerful people in this community, this theocracy hierarchy, then the only person she seems to be able to see as a victim is become a victim to her own for her own needs is Tichiba. And so Tichiba is called forth and they spring on Tichiba just to because she they see as the most likely person to be involved with the devil. And Tichiba is cornered basically as she enters the room and accuses accusations uh, fly at her and Paris says, You will confess yourself, I will take out take you out and whip you to death, Tichiba. And Putman says, this woman must be hanged. So Tichiba all of a sudden is thinking, I could die here, I need to do something about this. And Hale sort of takes her under his wing and, and guides her through a confession, a, a false confession, in terms of being in league with the devil because to save her own skin. And so Tichiba reaches some hysterical stage and sobs and thanks them and, and creates a story, a story that they want to believe that the devil's um, being mischievous in the town and through her and then she even gets to a stage where she starts accusing people and she accuses Goody Good and she accuses Sarah Good and Goody Osborne to deflect any blame from her and so they have this this whole situation where and the other girls get caught into it and Betty finally wakes up because you think that Betty may be semi-conscious and realising that she, tr- she was trying to escape the dancing with the woods and the ramifications and consequences and now she realises that because Tichip is blaming people and um, speaking others' names, then she can join in, so she does. And so they're saying, well, uh, that means Betty's healed, and so this is all good. And uh, Abigail joins in as well, and that they gain this sense of power over over themselves and over their own destiny, but also in accusing others. And so the scene ends with this crescendo of, of passion and cries and um, of almost jubilation where they, they're pointing fingers at, uh, these people who are unable to defend themselves because of their status in society, whether they're alcoholics or homeless or um, being cast away from the church or uh, have mental issues, uh, they're, they're the first scapegoats, I suppose, in this situation to happen. That's in terms of the sort of wider perspective of the encounter and conflict, I suppose it defines people's reactions to intense situations and there's, there's a variety of reactions, I suppose, but um, because survival is the essential instincts and the sort of inherent drive to avoid death, then Tichipo and Abigail, to a lesser extent, and Betty all exhibit that self-serving actions, which is understandable in Tichipo, obviously. And then we have Hale, who sees this conflict as a as a challenge um, to define himself even further as a as a reverend who you know um, is a saviour to others. And then obviously the Pullmans in the background, looking just looking for people to blame for their own misery, which can happen in conflict. And so they can, and because people, I suppose they don't want to see coincidence or bad luck or other external circumstances. It's always got to be blamed on either. Um, the devil or you know the goodness of God for things to happen so then that finishes there in that crescendo bit with the girls and uh, we move to act two which is a completely different atmosphere at the beginning at least at any rate where John Proctor and Elizabeth uh, and John arrives home from planting in, in their on their farm he brings his gun I suppose the gun is a symbol that there's rewarding um Native American Indians still prevalent on the surrounds of the community and so they're an ever-present threat that uh, the inhabitants have to be wary of and so that heightens their sort of the intensity of their existence and then they move into this 
the, the, the cabin, which is, I suppose, quite a tranquil place. And there's there's domesticity there, and the union between the two seems initially at least to be quite cordial and, and almost loving and tender and so forth. But there's obviously an undercurrent that emerges quite quickly. And we, we see that in terms of their they interact and their dialogue is a little bit forced and a little bit measured and there's words unspoken that are happening there. And I suppose in conflict that that sometimes is the case where the it's simmering, the conflict is simmering, we're ready, ready to explode in terms of that. And the key thing about their relationship is that he betrayed Elizabeth and she can't forgive him and he can't forgive himself. There's, there's that they've lost trust. And in terms of a layer for conflict, I think that this is about resolution between those two. I mean, their whole journey throughout the play is about resolution, where they can they can find some type of middle ground where they can meet each other again. Um, where, where, I mean, they'll never recapture sort of the love and tenderness that they had, but they they need to repair some of their relationship. And in, in conflict, if you don't forgive, um, then it's impossible um, for that conflict not to continue and for any type of peace real peace, not this pretend peace that they have to occur. And he's doing he says he's doing everything within his power to try and um, make up for what he's done. And Elizabeth says and they start talking about Abigail and Abigail's role in what's happening. And Elizabeth is obviously very skeptical and um, suspicious of Abigail Abigail and how he, Abigail it seems has become this when I know this Moses who parts the Red Sea, they, it says um, Abigail brings the other girls in the court and where she walks the crowd will part like the sea for Israel. And I think that if we look again for a layer, for a wider context of the play, then we see that those people with power like McCarthy did, they, they it becomes, it defines who they are and becomes part of them. And this aura, there's this aura created because of the consequences that they can have on other people's lives and the domineering, controlling authority that they, they seem to have when, you know, days before or weeks before that didn't occur. And so they are the catalyst, I suppose, for this conflict also, obviously, to continue. And John Proctor sums it up and calls it a black mischief, and I suppose it is in turn because this is a young teenage girl who's causing lots of problems. And Elizabeth says to him, you need to go to Salem and explain to them that she's telling the lies that he knows she is, but he's hesitant to do this. Now, if he's hesitant to do this, we can make assumptions about because he has committed adultery and that could be revealed in court. And so his sort of moral armour or his mask will be um, will be destroyed and he will be you know, sort of naked in the face and judgments of um, the people surrounding him, but also because... There is, because he blushes when he sees her, and there is, and his conversation with her in Act 1 shows that he's, there's still some some lust, some attraction that he can't control, and he's embarrassed by his inability to do this. I suppose that Abigail um, senses his uncomfortability and enjoys um, the effect that she has on him in terms of that. And to combat his, I suppose, guilt, it's still... Um, having feelings for Abigail, he accuses Elizabeth of being unable to forgive him. And he says, you forget nothing and forgive nothing. So this again refers back to what I was sort of theme about forgiveness and retribution and moving on and how, if that's unable to occur, then obviously the, the divergence um, will continue unabated to some extent. And Elizabeth's got, Elizabeth's got a beautiful, probably one of the best lines in the play when she says, I do not judge you. The magistrate sits in your heart that judges you. She says this to John Proctor, but I think that with any type of internal conflict, that's exactly what happens, is that we all, when we have these, this turmoil, uh, we do judge ourselves or criticise ourselves or question ourselves in terms of conflict and what is right and what is wrong and what are our choices and whether we can forgive ourselves or not. And I think that's really important in terms of examples and conflict. And I suppose if you look beyond this, it, strikes me that you think about uh, Bernard Simpson from My Lay Massacre who could never forgive himself for the brutality that he inflicted upon the innocent civilians of that village. 
uh, Mary Wine then enters and there's that little by play, Mary Wine being very vulnerable, very naive, very quite defenceless, girl who's moulded by others basically. John Proctor bullies her, Elizabeth can't bully her, but Abigail bullies her and she walks in and she's got this sort of fake um, form of authority because she's one of the girls who are pronouncing guilt on uh, other people within the court and John Proctor can't believe that this that this serving girl has changed somewhat, I suppose, and, he, and he's quite uh, angered by her refusal to stay on the farm and not do as Elizabeth wishes. And so they have this um, conflict and this argument in terms of uh, what, what her role is and what she should be doing. And unknown to us initially when we first read the play, the poppet that Mary Wine brings is the the symbol of Abigail's deceit and Elizabeth somewhat baffled takes this present and we find out a few pages later what uh, Abigail's little trick was in terms of the poppet. Then after Mary Wine goes to bed, uh, Proctor and Elizabeth continue on their argument and finally he relents and, and says he will go to court to expose Abigail and and he says to Elizabeth, I see now your spirits twist around the single error of my life and I will never tear it free. And the question is, can people be defined by a single, single error of what they're doing? Can they? I don't know if this is recording and it's really annoying. <laughs> is this the truth about people? No, I just no. I can't do that. What's going on? Hello, hello. Why's it doing that? It keeps going. Hello. So, hello. Hello. Why is it? What? What's going on? There's nothing going on. Nothing's happening. Oops. Nothing's happening. It's not left, right, there's something minus to it. I don't know what's happening. With this. That's not recording. This isn't recording. Input level? What the hell does that mean? 